podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. This is an ad for Roundup Weed and Grass Killer with Sure Shot Wand. It kills weeds down to the root so they don't come back. It works for you, your neighbor, your neighbor's neighbor, and his neighbor's neighbor. It's Roundup Weed and Grass Killer with Sure Shot Wand. When used as directed, always read and follow pesticide label directions. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. Leaving out the avocado in your salad to save money is not good for morale or your fiber intake. Luckily, State Farm knows the value of the little things. It's why they've got options, like insuring your home and ride with surprisingly great rates on both. Because you shouldn't have to give up what you love for great insurance. For surprisingly great rates, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Welcome to the French Open Day 6, I believe it is. It used to be very easy when they just started on... Monday because you know it's Friday that'd be day five but it's not it's Friday and it's day six uh this is of course our podlet you will have heard and if you haven't already heard please do go back and listen to our full length love tennis pod uh from last night with Calvin Bett on George Belshaw as you'll know our podlets are not always full compliment we have incredibly unusually a full compliment for tonight's podlet so we're gonna have to work hard to keep it within the mandated half an hour or whatever the made-up number I say it has to be under is. Uh, I'm joined by George Belshaw and Calvin Betton to look back on what has been, I'm, again, I'm not going to say the most dramatic day of French Open action, but an intriguing one nevertheless, uh, and to look forward to the first Saturday of the French Open, everything that has within it. Um, maybe the best place to start is the first match of the day. It's the match that I immediately came to Roland Garros to watch. It was Leila Fernandez against Belinda Bencic. It, I, I think it had potential to be an awful match, especially as I was looking forward to it. It did. It was not. It was 2 hours 49. It was three sets. It was proper ding-dong stuff. The level was really high. George, I don't know if you expected that to be as good a match as it was. Um, I think I expected it to be pretty competitive. Pro- probably had Bencic down as a slight favourite, to be honest. Um, I think she, she, I probably have her down in my mind as the slightly stronger clay player. And, um, you know, Fernandez hasn't necessarily kind of found top form this year, really, uh, beyond that kind of one title out in Mexico or wherever it was. Um, Which she always wins. I think that's two years in a row now she's won that title. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I, it's a good result. I think I, I actually. I was really worried about the bottom half of the draw to start the tournament. I'm actually looking at it with quite a lot of excitement now, probably a lot more than the top half, because the top half just feels like Sviante is going to blast away through with maybe Bedosa putting up a bit of a fight. But the bottom half's like quite cool, I think. Like we've got Anna Samova kicking around Goff, Fernandez, even like Jill Teichman's kind of just quite a random name, but someone who's uh, only random it. if you didn't spend the entire spring building a clay core model that spat out <laughs> Jill Teichman as a person to watch. But yeah, sure, random, whatever you want to say. But um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it, it, it'd be good for the game if we got like a big Anisimova goth semi-final or something, which probably means we'll get Trevor Sand versus uh, Sloane Stevens or something. Which, <laughs> yeah, could be worse. Well, I think the problem with the bottom half is that the four, I think, best players are all clumped together, barring maybe Goff. But Bencic, Fernandez, Anisimova and Makova, we'll come on to Makova in a moment, um, are kind of all the best players. Um you ben- were back in curb of the quarters yesterday, James. Yeah, that, well, that lasted things, long. Cha- things change, Cal. Things change, George. Things change. Um... <laughs> I, I really enjoyed, I was, I mean, I, I haven't, I've rarely, just because of the way tennis works, it's actually quite rare that I spend a whole match on court, um, partly because most of the seats are really uncomfortable, but I actually spent pretty much the entire Benchich Fernandez match on court because it was so absorbing. Um, there was one moment where, <laughs> I, this is pretty rare, and I'm sure I've seen it before, but I can't remember seeing it in person, Benchich got a time violation while receiving serve, which must be pretty rare. Um, and she then obviously argued about it, and Leila Fernandez then composed herself and took another serve, during which Bencic ran to the other side of the court and then ran back to prove what point, I don't know. But she got so angry that she then just hit three winners and broke serve. So I don't know, maybe Belinda Bencic should be getting more angry more often. Um, Calvin, I suspect you would have had Bencic as a slight favourite in that match as well, but... It's interesting to see Leila Fernandez kind of finding her feet on clay in, in more ways than one. 
Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd her as a slight favourite just because of Fernandez being pretty poor since the US Open. As mm. as a, I mean, both her and Raducanu have. If we'd have told us in September that this would what we'd be looking at from both of them in May, we wouldn't have believed that. No. They both haven't kicked on at all. Um, but yeah, so that's the only reason I would have had a favourite. But I think in terms of actual quality, I, I think there's not much in it at all. Mm. Um, she's going to go on and play Amanda Anisimova in the fourth round. Uh, she came through a very well, what should have been a very tricky match with Karolina Makova. They played an 89-minute first set. Uh, it was 7-6 to Makova in a, a 16-point tie break. And then in the second set, with just four games gone, Makova caught her right foot in the clay. She twisted her ankle quite nastily. And to be honest, that was pretty much that. She lost the set 6-2. She was then three love down in the third uh, when she eventually retired with heavy strapping on that right angle. All right ankle. George, I, I'm going to suggest that you would think or would have thought that she would have gone to gone on to win that match. Uh, I thought it was, you know, it was pretty tight, wasn't it? Obviously, with the kind of nine-seven first set. I, I said before the match, I thought Makova is like a bit of a dark horse in that section. I thought she's like a really underrated player sometimes, and she's obviously dipped down with injury. And it was, you know, kind of really sad to see her in tears in the kind of latter stages of that match. You know, trying to serve, trying to get through. She played on way too long, to be honest. Like it was clear she was absolutely done but um, she was a set up and maybe probably doesn't fancy the grass that much anyway so i guess she's i think she's of... a good grass player this is the thing i i wouldn't be ruining my Wimbledon. Season. i think she's a really good all court player Mukova. i think you know injuries is what was holding her back a minute um but yeah look it it was disappointing but i think anisimova i still probably would have slightly favoured her in the match either way, even though it was mighty, mighty close. Um, and I think Anasimo is probably probably my favourite to go on to the final from the bottom half now, to be honest. Um, I think she's having a really good year, playing really impressive stuff. Um, I'll you know, tell you the took... only reason I doubt that, George, and I'm sort of with you, I think she's had a great year on clay and the model really likes her. But when Makova got injured, Anasimova went to bits like properly for like three or four games she didn't know what to do and it was just such like a fragile 20 minutes i was gonna i was gonna i was gonna go on to say that, that it, it did take her a while to work out but there is something weird and calvin i'll tell you this you know it, there is something weird about playing someone injured in tennis they start like really swinging going for their shots they can be quite dangerous even if not that mobile and it, it sometimes just takes a few games to you know, kind of work out, right, I need to make this person run. I need to kind of get the drop shots, you know, when you're not 100% sure how bad the injury is at first, etc. I, mm. I don't know how clear a view she had of it, but, um, you know, maybe more so in the kind of men's game where they've got the serious, seriously powerful uh, ground slope strokes, etc. It can be really, really hard to play an injured player. But, yeah, look, it, she got the job done eventually, so I wouldn't, wouldn't worry too much about it. I mean, Calvin, you're not allowed to coach on court, but if you were given... The chance to coach a player whose opponent has just, you know, turned their ankle. Surely it's not complicated, is it? Um, it's it's a strange mindset because, as George kind of alluded to there, you don't see things in shades of grey when that happens. You see it's black and white. Yeah. You think they're injured. Why are they still playing? How am I not winning every single point? Why can't they still <laughs> run? And you know, in reality, it might just have taken fifteen percent of their movement out. Hmm. which is still quite a lot, but in your own mind, you're thinking this should have taken 100% of their movement out and you start building pressure on yourself then. Um, but so if you're playing somebody in, who's injured, my sort of advice is always to just play as if they're not injured because right. that's that's what would get you there because it's, you know, you can say, why aren't you moving them around? But well, you'd be doing that anyway, wouldn't you? Like, why, why would you, there's not, not really any point in tennis if you're going to say, don't, don't let them move ever. Like, <laughs> so you'd, all, you'd, you'd always be trying to move them, hit the ball away from them. That's the very basic tactic of tennis. On the flip side, you've kind of got Makova 
desperately popping painkillers, praying she's going to get some sort of boost and kind of vaguely trying to hang around. Um, for, you I think know, she did a great job in fairness. Set. Yeah, she hung around for ages, to be fair. Um, eventually, obviously, got too much, and the painkillers just weren't making any difference, which we probably could have guessed quite well, early on. But yeah, exactly. it's, it's a funny mindset. Without wanting to get into it too deeply, what I found really interesting was it was her right ankle that had kind of been injured, and actually it was her backhand that she ended up struggling on, which, you know, sort of intuitively, I would think right ankle running to her right, surely that's the problem, but somehow it ended up being the backhand. I, I don't know whether that's me not understanding the technical stuff going on here, Calvin, but my instinct would have been that if your right ankle is injured, running to the back to, to the forehand would have been the problem. I think it's just either side if you're playing with it. I mean, I find it strange that she played on with painkillers because the thing is when... The, I can understand the painkillers if you've got kind of a little bit of a muscle strain or something like that. Mm. If you roll your ankle, the ankle swells up. It's no longer stable. It's mm. not really just about the pain. It's not about being able to play through the pain. You can't put weight on your ankle or else it will roll again. It will keep rolling. Mm. Um, and so, then you end up doing serious damage, I guess. Yeah, and and then it's one of those, isn't it? You can't. The players get slated if they pull out early and they just they just don't even try. But in that situation, there's no real point. Mm. Um, it was a brave effort, nevertheless. But uh, yeah, Amanda Asimova through to the fourth round uh, relatively safely. I mean, she's not cruised through, but um, she is through nevertheless. Uh, she will play, as I mentioned, Leila Fernandez uh, further down. Elise Mertens. Uh, beats Vivara Gracheva. She'll play Coco Goff, uh, who pretty much she's old enough to be her mother, quite frankly. <laughs> There's an enormous age difference there. But Coco Goff came through the giant killer of the WTA Tour. She beat Kaya Kinepi 6-3, 6-4, without really breaking sweat. I mean, Calvin, I know you've been kind of looking at Coco Goff and saying it's time for her to really make a big impact. She got to the quarterfinals here last year. She's into the fourth round again, and, and she's looking pretty smooth, to be fair. Yeah, I think it's a matter of time. I do. I still think she's a multiple Grand Slam winner. Um, you're seeing a bit of the next generation, aren't we now, coming through mm. with, with I guess, with Raducanu and Fernandez played the last uh, sorry, US Open final. And now you've got Anisimova, Goff. You'd, you'd lump them in there as well. Andrescu's obviously already won one. We're starting to see that, that next generation competing there, I guess, mm to a level that it hasn't happened on the men's tour yet. And and I, I watched them play, and as I say, I watched a lot of Fernandez and um, Bench yesterday. I watched a bit of Goff Canepi, and they do... I don't want to kind of slag off Raducanu here without, you know, really meaning to, but they do seem to hit the ball differently from her. They seem to have a bit more, like, a bit more knee bend, a bit more aggression on the ball. That seems to be their style that... I don't know, maybe I'm misreading Raducanu's game, Calvin, but it, it feels to me like that's a game style that is now going to be pretty effective. It's it's. More, I don't think it's that. It's more what I touched on the other day, is that Raducanu is just, she just looks too well drilled. It's mm -hmm. like everything is a drill. She's Look, she can hit the ball as hard as Leila Fernandez. There's no right. question about that. Look, Fernandez takes more risks. And Raducanu, is, is, she looks like the way that she's been training, the way that she's trained and the way that her mindset is working, she's too well drilled. She's right. playing like it's a, like someone has set out and gone, don't miss any balls. Let, let, so let, she's not let, going for the lines, basically. Yeah, but that's, you know, you only have to listen to her interviews. That's what she thinks she needs to do. Mm. Uh, but that, as you're saying, it's not going to get it done. No. You, these players are hitting clean winners, but there's no reason why... Why Fernandez should hit the ball harder than I mean, and this is a bit different. This has got long limbs that Raducanu doesn't doesn't have. She can hit the ball a bit, and none of them are ever going to hit the ball as hard as Naomi Osaka. <laughs> but yeah, she she's no reason why, you know, she can hit a clean ball. Mm. Um, and into the bottom half of the draw, um, Sloan Stevens dispatched Diane Parry, the French girl with the one-handed backhand. It was uh, a game that Philip Chatteret was very excited for. It was a match that Philip Chatrier did not very much enjoy. Uh, it was very one-sided, and that's kind of just what happens when the world number 97 comes to the end of her run. Um, Sloan Stevens will now play Jill Teichman, the Swiss left-hander who beat Victoria Azarenka 10-5 in a match tie-break uh, at the end of the third set. I mean, George, it was... I was watching it and then I had to run out and do a press conference, and I came back, and Jill Teichman was answering questions about how well she'd won. 
I mean, you know, Victoria Azarenka's been around. You've got to play pretty good pressure tennis to beat her in that situation, haven't you? You do, yeah. I mean, I, I fancy Teichman before the match, uh, to be honest. Like, I wasn't really, never been that convinced by Azarenka on clay, and I think Teichman's kind of taking a step forward. But in this sort of really tight match, you'd kind of fancy Azarenka, you know, the mm. experience of kind of feeling the moment, getting it done. So serious credit to Teichman. And I think, you know, she, she's going to be tough to beat in this this half. I mean, I, as I said before, I, I hope it is Goff in the semi-finals because I think this is a really good chance for her to keep announcing herself and kind of get a slow start to the year back on track. Uh, but you you couldn't really knock it if Titan was the player who goes on to the semis or even the final because she's playing really consistently well over the last year and, and kind of from nowhere, to be honest. Like, mm. I don't think anyone saw her being a, a top, 20 possibly top 10 player who knows by the end of this tournament um in terms of like like a regular consistent player i think yeah that's a that's a, a solid solid top 10 top 20 player you know i think she's a good top 50 player beforehand but yeah i think she's really really improved and good good on her yes i mean she's come in with like a significant number of wins on clay as well like she won four matches in madrid she won three matches in rome you know, she's come in with decent form under her, which I always think is is really important, especially in WTA where it is only best two or three. And runs at decent size events kind of last year yeah. as well. I think I think that always does just help in terms of building a bit of confidence, belief you can do it when it really mm. matters. So, yeah. Those fourth round matchups we will see, of course, on Sunday, and we'll talk a little bit more about in Saturday's Podlet. Um, let's talk about what we've got in the women's draw tomorrow which is the top half in the third round. Um, I'm going to mention that Iga Shontek is playing Danka Kovinic, and that is all we need to say about that. Uh, we can move on swiftly because there is no one who doesn't know the result of that match already. Uh, Zheng Quinn Wen is playing Elise Corne, uh, the winner of which plays Shontek. Um, I think it's largely irrelevant who wins that match, and therefore I'm kind of going to move past it. Like, I'm sure the French crowd will get very excited about it. It'll be a big deal. Um, it's on Chatrier. There really is no proper relevance to the result. I really want to look at kind of section three and four, really, because I think this is where the contenders to beat Shonta are going to come from. It's where her semi final opponent is going to come from. Paula Bedosa has probably her biggest test of the tournament so far against. Veronica Kudamatova, Madison Keys against Elena Rybakina, Shelby Rogers against Dara Kasakina, and Camille Georgie against Arena Sabalenka. If we have to pick from one of those four ties someone to give Shvontek the best game, who do we think it is? Georgie, you go first. Bedosa, definitely. And um, why? Because she's been in really good form over the last year and she's naturally built for the player. I think she's mm. yeah, I think she she's the player I definitely think would kind of give her the best game and also again kind of t- similarly to what I was just saying about Teichman there, you know, Bedosa has been to big finals, big you know, even more than Teichman, you know, she's really established herself at the top of the game. I don't think she'd be kind of overwhelmed or scared of that match. I think a lot of the other guys in there, you know, okay, Keys has been to a Grand Slam final but really been quite poor whenever it's been a big big match in her career um Sabalenka's yet to kind of do it in the latter stages and everyone else is kind of similar so yeah I think uh Bedos is the one for me Calvin if if, if Arena Sabalenka can come through Camille Georgie and potentially Daria Kasatkina I mean is there any chance that she could blow someone like Shontek away no <laughs> good excellent <laughs> No, I agree with George. It's it's Bedosa, but Bedosa won't test Swantec either. That'll be straightforward. There's, I mean, who will test her at this tournament? There's anyone? nobody. She's she's streets ahead of all the other females in the draw. What what would have I, to happen for her to lose? Like generally? injury? <sighs> no, I mean, no. I say she's streets ahead. There's there's certain players who I think she would be more uncomfortable against. I don't think she'd particularly enjoy playing Anisimova. I don't think she'd enjoy playing Goff because they're two players. Again, I always come back to this, who she would know from juniors who, who were good players in juniors. So she knows what they can do, but I think she's got a pretty good, good idea now how good she is. And I think she just knows she's better than everybody else. And she's won this tournament before. Hmm. Let's not forget that. 
I think previously I have thought that to beat Shontek you need someone who just blows them off the blows her off the court. I don't think that anymore. I think the rally tolerance is more important. I think someone who can stay in rallies a longer time with Shontek is more important than someone who can just take the racket out of her hand. I don't know, that might be total nonsense, but I, I flipped on that a little bit. To, to be honest, I just think she's pretty gloriously rounded, Sviontek. It's kind of similar to what I was saying about Alcaraz a few weeks ago. Like, I, I don't look at any part of Sviontek's game and be like, yeah, that's a serious, significant hole. There's going to be a certain type of player who she plays against who she's going to really struggle against. You know, There are, there are players out there who can have a, a perfect day and beat her. And, you know, she's. we saw her lose to Danielle Collins at the Australian Open. Let's not pretend she's not infallible. It's not like she's won every single Grand Slam. This is still a big mental test in the latter stages of a slam. But yeah, she's she's in astonishing form and just looks straight ahead as Calvin says. I mean, I think the one thing I will say is, again, we get to, I sort of talk about this quite a bit. We get into that stage where it's so long since she's been close in a match that you never know what mental challenges come if a match does get close. Mm. Uh, I always, I use the, it's my Andre Agassi theory. I've said it many times before that one year in the run to the Australia and in, in run to the U S open, I guess he was in the kind of form that Svontek is now where he just, he just battered absolutely everybody right through until I think it was either the semi or the final against Sampras and Sampras won the first set and ended up winning the match in straight sets. And I guess he said in the press conference, he'd forgotten how to be losing. <laughs> he'd forgotten how to play when he was behind in a match and it, and it, and it stuck with me and that's probably 20 years old that, mm. um, but I, I mean, I also think that if Osaka's fully fit and in the right straight state of mind at the, hard court season then that's still a, a big threat to her yeah definitely i mean yeah i mean so t- what's been the toughest match she's had since australia was it samson over she pushed her pretty hard and she took a set lead and uh Kerber. lost i mean since um, australia ostapenko beat her yeah the first set against um was it osaka was that seven five or seven six and then she ran away with. I mean, she she did. Six, she was on Drescu. She beat seven six the other week, and then took six love. I think she did the same yeah, thing. So, it, yeah. No, Samsonova. Yes, she lost the. This is end of April. Lost the first set in a tie break. One second, one six four. Took the third seven five. I mean, a test. we're clutching at straws here. <laughs> <laughs> like, very much trying to find someone who might have nearly beaten Iga Shontek. And then Samson over went on to lose round one here. So no, no Yeah, threat. after I tipped her to win the tournament. Anyway, I mean, only <laughs> half jokingly. Uh, let's move on to the men's draw and look back at what we had today. Um, not too many shock results. I think Cam Norrie was the first of the top 12 seeds to go out. It's the first time that the top 12 seeds in the men's draw have made it through to the third round since 2008. 14 years, I'm reliably informed. Norrie is now out, uh, having been beaten by Karen Hatchinoff in four fairly tight sets. I mean, there's very few uh, one-sided sets when it comes to Cam Norrie matches. George, I've written down C plus for Cam Norrie's French Open. Yeah, I mean, again, I said yesterday, I didn't think there was much in that match beforehand. Um they could have played that match again tomorrow and it would have been the opposite result. I didn't think it was really one way or the other, just hatching off was taking the break points a little bit better. Um, I don't know. Cam, it, it just kind of feels like he's missing a slam result, doesn't it really? I think mm. fifth time in the third round, never been beyond. Okay, a lot of the other third rounds, he's played guys like Rafa and Roger, I think in at least three of those matches. Um, so yeah, you know, this as we said yesterday, for a third round draw, getting Karen Hatchinov is probably about as good as you're going to get in terms of a seed out there. Um, so yeah, a bit, bit disappointing to be honest. So it's not a massive criticism week. It's another decent clay court season, etc. But you know, it's always a bit of a what if. But let's be honest, he probably would have lost to Alcaraz next round <laughs> anyway. So it's not like I was thinking he's going to win the tournament or anything. Almost certainly, it's worth noting that Karen Hatchinov is into the last sixteen of Roland Garros for the fifth time in the last six years, uh, thanks to Jose Morgado on Twitter for that particular stat. Um, I mean, I, I have been saying for a while that Hatchinoff is a not a big threat on clay, but he's someone you don't want to play in the first week because he's he's got a good record of getting through those matches. So 
Um, as you say, George, not the, the worst defeat in the world for Cam. I mean, Calvin, do you, do you have anything to add on that? I think I'd give him a bit better than a C. Um, it's not his favourite surface. And Achenov is a decent player. He's a former top 10 player. Hmm. Um, and, you know, with, with Cam's game style, the way that he plays, there's no guarantees. He's he's a very good player and he's legitimately a top 10 in the world player. But he he against players like Hatchinov, it's it's kind of going to be on Hatchinov's racket. Hmm. Yeah. Seems it, reasonable. It is worth... It's worth saying on that point that, to be fair, you know, Cam Norrie had a, a set point, I think, in the third set where Hatchinov just landed the perfect forehand right on the line. He went for it on his own serve, took it. And then the next game, he broke and flipped it around. You know, we're talking a couple of inches that caught the outside of the line. That That's the difference in that sort of match sometimes. And fair play to Hatchinov. He, he, he stepped up in the big moments as top guys do. So, hmm. yeah, no great shame for Cam. No. Um, in other results in the third round in the men's draw today, uh, I'm going to lump Djokovic, Nadal and Alcaraz all in together. They all won in straight sets. None of them went to a tie break. It was very much business as usual. I thought that Alcaraz might get pushed by Korda. Korda never got anywhere near him, realistically. Um, Rafa was broken in his first service game by Botic van der Zanschloop. That was as about as close as he got to being tested. Um, although I did note that he... Um, in press, he said, someone said, oh, you know, you're playing Felix or Aliassim in the next round. He's obviously coached by your uncle. Like, are you scared of that? And he said, no, I'm not. Um, maybe it'd be quite nice to, to have a test. It's going to be a good test in some ways. That's what I need. And then he kind of caught himself and he was like, oh, but, you know, today was a very good test, obviously. And clear, clear, clearly he did not think that <laughs> Botic van der Zanschloop's 11 games, or 9 games, I should say, were worth mentioning, George. I'll be pretty surprised right now if the fourth round's any greater of a test, to be perfectly honest. I think he'll wipe the floor with Felix tomorrow. I hope I'm wrong. It'd be nice to, have to see Felix have a big slam match against one of the, the top guys, but I think Rafa will uh, school him. I, guess I found... Tony Nadal's comments quite strange because he said he won't be there for the match, um, and he said he said he, he won't be there for the match. He said he'd already told Felix that he won't advise him on how to beat his nephew. And yeah, it's odd, I, isn't it? I, yeah, I find it particularly strange in that the position in Felix's career that he is and that he chose to take on Tony Nadal, he's not like somebody who's a hundred in the world and he wants to take him to the top twenty. He was to, he was thinking he was like. 11 in the world and he wants somebody to take him to win in slams if you're going to win slams you're probably going to have to go through Rafa Nadal at some stage hmm. and your coach is not going to tell you how to beat him yeah I think it's pretty weird I mean Rafa was very kind of blunt about it it was the first question he was asked and he you know he was Rob Moore from the Sun who's you know very good at asking the direct question and uh, Rafa said he said oh are you not going to talk to him and Rafa said no I already talk with Tony and you know he was he said he's, he said you're all going to ask me this, but I, it's very simple. He's my uncle. He won't be able to want me to lose, but he's a professional. He's with another player. Like I don't think that's the right thing to say. I think you can say yeah, he's a professional. He's with another player, and he's going to do his job. But to say I don't think he'll be able to want me to lose, I think that's weird, George. That doesn't sound like he's being very professional if he's not going to advise the player he's currently working. With. Well, exactly. he's not going to watch it. Not, not, gonna, not gonna advise. He's not gonna watch it. I mean, let's face it. As George says, I don't think it makes a blind bit of difference. Felix Auger-Aliassime seems isn't good enough to be roughing it up. I, I don't think it matters in this right here. But what if they play at Wimbledon in a few weeks' time? I mean, no Wimbledon's no ranking points. What if they play U.S. Open semis or final? Mm. What are we get into then? Like, I just, I, I don't see how this that's feasible at all. No. Uh, we'll maybe discuss that a little bit more tomorrow ahead of their match on Sunday. We think that might be the uh, Sunday night match. Um, that I mean, there were no big results. Sorry, George, go on. Maybe we'll do this tomorrow, but I, I just thought the Nadal and Djokovic comments were quite interesting today as well. It felt like they're kind of leading towards, you know, everyone starts to report, oh, Djokovic and Nadal on course for the quarterfinals. And you kind of alluded to the night match there. I mean, it's quite clear Novak wants that to be a big night match and Rafa desperately wants to play that in the middle of the afternoon. But maybe Calvin can tell us why that would be tomorrow. Okay, Rafa said it was because view. of the humidity. He likes the heat, doesn't he? But he doesn't like the humidity. 
So when it's more humid, the ball fluffs up more, right? And it doesn't bounce as sharply. And, you know, Rafa wants it to be dry and, like, coarse and something he can spin the ball off. And, and it, I guess it doesn't move as quickly through the air either. Which Yeah, and it's, it's cold at night. It's mm. not... Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're there, James. You're there, James. Is it is it noticeably cold at night? Oh, yeah. I mean, I take a long sleeve tee with me every day yeah. because it does get chilly at night. You're right. I remember yeah. we were... The, the French Open, the one that moved to September, I mean, we were all thinking, oh, yeah, this tournament's going to really favour Novak because it's cold and awful. And, and Rafa absolutely pumped him <laughs> in the final. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Rafa spent the whole week yeah. before the tournament complaining about the balls and then absolutely horsed it. So, yeah, maybe maybe it's all just, just gameplay. But... It's a strange dynamic, though, that, because if you think about Nadal's game style in general, he's the chaser, he makes a lot of balls. He's, he wants to keep the ball in play. doesn't make many errors. But when he plays Djokovic, he has to be the aggressor. Hmm. So the dynamic changes from what he'd normally want. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I do also think, like, you know, the spin element, the, the spit of the Nadal forehand, like, that's so much of what he is hard to play against. Yes, defensively he's brilliant, but he's also a really aggressive player. Like, Or uh, he is hard to play when he is the aggressor, at least. So... There's that as well. Um, we should note the one big upset of the men's draw today. Uh, it was Barnaby, Bernabe Zapata Merales, who I've been telling you about for days because <laughs> I've picked him in fantasy bloke. tennis. I love him. He's a brilliant bloke to watch. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Um, he did when he beat Anton Matusevic in five sets in qualifying for Wimbledon last year. He did when he beat John Isner today. It was proper ding-dong. He led the match. He had six match points before he finally sealed it. Uh, John Isner was making sarcastic vamoses to the crowd at one point because he was getting so wound up. It was everything you want from like a court seven third round five setter, you know, with maybe a couple of hundred fans, but bleachers like properly full to the rim. Probably, probably the first time I'm ever going to be actively supporting Zverev heavily in a match <laughs> on Monday. I need this guy out of this draw. He's killing me. I've got a yeah a friend who, um, obviously James beating me as well, is very sad in fantasy. But I've got another friend who I've got a, a bottle of wine on to who finishes higher. And I, I was streets ahead before this bloke tore through today. So it's causing me no, no end of headaches. Sorry, George. I have no sympathy, I'm afraid. Um, let's move on to the men's matches that we've got tomorrow, uh, which is the rest of the third round. I mean, there's not. this is the bottom half of the men's draw, so there aren't many great picks. I suppose the best match there is probably Daniil Medvedev against Mayamir Kekmanovic. Um, Calvin, Kekmanovic has made a lot of progress over the last 12 months. Uh, is there any chance that he stops Daniil Medvedev or at least <laughs> takes him beyond four games in a set? Uh, yeah, I think he could. I don't think he will. Um, <laughs> but I, no, I might be a bit harsh there. He's the best player that Medvedev's played so far. Oh, for sure. I think. Um, so yeah, I, I, it wouldn't surprise. I think Medvedev will win, but it wouldn't surprise see him losing a set there. Um, George, similarly. Yeah, I. You know, you make Medvedev the favourite, but. I wouldn't be shocked if he lost that match. I was still, I still think we don't know exactly where Medvedev's at physically. Um, he's not been pushed at all yet, and Kesmanovic should make it a good match if he can get that first set. Could be an awkward afternoon, for Medvedev. George, I know you're going to agree. I have picked in my um, iNews.co.uk preview for tomorrow, Goffin versus Hercat as my yeah. match of the day. Big fantasy game for me as well. <laughs> You have Goffan, yeah. presumably. I have Goffan, yep. To Goff or to Goffan. You know, they're, they're really dragging me along those two. So you can tell <laughs> I'm very supportive of them tonight. If um, you try yeah. and take your bias out of it for a minute, how do you genuinely Impossible. think that match looks? Yeah, no, I think it'll be close. Um, I think Goffan beat him a few weeks back. Her cats, you know, this is the sort of match he has to, has to be winning if he wants to really kind of push on and become a, a top five player, which I'm sure he has ambitions to do. Um, but I think Goffin's doing really well. He's fighting hard. He's looking confident again. Uh, won that title in Marrakesh. I think it'll be close. I, I can see that going five sets and being very long and uh, with lots of ups and downs. Also, if Verkash wants to be a top five player, got to get some points because he's losing a lot in a few weeks' time. Mm. Well, yeah. Puts a bit of pressure on, doesn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, it's exactly the same thing as Denis Shapovalov said, that he felt pressure to pick up points here because he knows he's going to be losing quite a lot when it comes to Wimbledon. And yeah, as you say, Hercats obviously beat Federer at Wimbledon last year, which um, yeah racked him up a lot of points. Uh, the other matches tomorrow, Kasper Rude against Lorenzo Sonego, uh, Mikel Emer against Stefano Tsitsipas, Andre Rublo against Christian Garin, which I have to say, taking and I have Garin in my fantasy team, so obviously I fancy him more, but like... I don't think that's the easiest match in the world for Rublev, is it? Uh, that's got five sets written all over it. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Abs- <laughs> like, th- I'd be amazed if that doesn't go to five sets. And it'll be on some random little court as well, so no one will watch it. Well, apart from, you know, like 100 people on the court. It'll it'll be a proper, like, 8pm fist-pumping to 150 people job. Uh, we've also got Mackenzie McDonald against Yannick Sinner, who... Has kind of gone under the radar, Yannick Sinner. You know, we usually talk about him a lot in this tournament, but um, just because he's not been in terrific form and he's had quite a quiet draw, um, if he comes through that, he will play either Rublev or Garin. And then Gilles Simon against Marin Cilic. I don't think that's an easy game to pick. Gilles Simon will refuse to retire. He beat Karenia Buster in five sets. He beat Steve Johnson in straight sets. And Cilic dropped a set to Fuksovic and isn't looking brilliant. I mean... Calvin, I don't think anyone would begrudge Gilles Seaman one more win here, would they? No, I think I'd probably make him a bit of favourite in that as well. I don't think. It amazes me that Chilich is still winning matches. Every time I see him, he's crap. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, just like like serving doubles all over the shop, like has no confidence in his second serve and like forehands a bit ropey. And then I just see him, he's made a final of it, like a 250 or something. And, yeah. Like, I, 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 I'm backing Chilich for that, but with the caveat, if it gets close, Simon will win because Chilich will real, really feel the pressure of the crowd and it'll be kind of hard for him. But I think Chilich will win. I think you missed one of the match out, though, and one of the ones I'm quite looking forward to, Rune Gaston. Yes, that is the Gaston. night match. That'll be fun. It's clashing with the football, so it's effectively not happening. <laughs> like, good luck yeah. to both of them, but I won't know who wins until Sunday morning. <laughs> I'll drop you a text. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll be I'll be watching the tennis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all we've got time for tonight. Uh, take care. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Sports Social Podcast Network. Bet there are some crossword fans out there: the pencil to paper people, the Sunday scholars, the word wanderers. Even if you're not a regular, you know how satisfying it is when you get a word right. Imagine that crossword fun, but in scratcher form. It's the Virginia Lottery's $300,000 Crossword Inferno Scratcher. Each ticket has three crossword puzzles. You could win up to $300,000. Virginia Lottery Scratchers. Every day wins. Visit a lottery retailer near you. For odds and more information, visit valottery.com.